No, 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 don't even, don't even play the intro, no, I... God, it's, it, it's like, my, my whole life has, has just been turned upside down. It has, it, it, because of, of this movie, I don't I don't The hell? All right, all right, I'll say it, I'll say it. King Kong is no longer just my favorite film. This movie I, I have to put on there as well. Pepion. Okay, so let me explain some of the history with me in this film first off. First off, the first time I watched this film, first, 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 first. First time I watched this film uh, was in fifth grade, which it was actually not long after I watched the original, King, I mean, uh, the 2005 remake of King Kong in theaters. And naturally, I, I fell in love with that film. I, the people who know that, who that is, I always say that that movie is what inspired me to be a film director, and it still is, don't think it's not. But... At the same time when that was going on, I watched this film called Papillon on AMC before AMC got totally mentally retarded. And I was mesmerized by this film. I watched it over and over and over and over and over again. And... Duh! And then I, I, I just got... I fell in love with this movie, and it always stuck in my head for a long time. But then we lost our DVR, and because we lost our DVR, I, I, I never saw the movie again, until not long ago. Because it's 31 Days of Oscars on TCM, which is my favorite channel of all time, they, they were playing movies by United Artists, which released uh, Papillon. And I was, I was, uh, saw, I was slipping through it, and I saw it coming on. So of course I taped it because I haven't seen this movie forever. And almost immediately when I started watching the movie, tears, just, just tears, began to pour from my eyes. And I kept watching, and they did not stop the entire movie. I had tears pouring out my eyes. No movie, I mean no fucking movie, has ever done that to me. Ever. And this is the first time I watched it since fifth grade. The fuck? The fuck? Papillon. Papillon, Papillon. What? an amazing piece of cinema this film is. Amazing piece of cinema puts it politely. How just phenomenally well done and put together this film is. This film was of course made in 1973. And what I didn't know about the movie in fifth grade, but now I do, is that Franklin J. Schaffner directed it. And, those of you who don't know who Franklin J. Schaffner, he is known for two, two big movies that he made around this time period, which was the science fiction epic Planet of the Apes and the war epic Patton. And I love those two movies, but I didn't know who J uh, Franklin J. Schaffner was until probably 8th grade. That was when I, I found out who he was because I started getting obsessed with Planet of the Apes and Patton. Uh, but... I had no fucking idea that he directed this movie. No idea. Absolutely no comprehension that Franklin J. Schaffner had directed this beautiful piece of cinema that has stuck in my head since that fateful day in eighth grade. Da! Da! Uh, 
Uh, the movie's amazing. Alright, the movie is just pure brilliance. This is cinema at its greatest, is this movie. Oh my god. It is just... It's tied with King Kong for my favorite film. It's, it's so fucking good. And, you know, now that I'm looking back at Franklin J. Schaffner's sort of career, watching this, and I'm like, yeah, that kind of screams Franklin J. Schaffner, and how it's shot, how it's edited, how the opening credits play out, how the end credits play out, it is very much Franklin J. Schaffner. This movie is, is just so amazing. Every single fucking part of this movie, every single shot, every bit of piece of music by Jerry Goldsmith is amazing. And how Jerry Goldsmith didn't win an Academy Award for the soundtrack on this movie is beyond me. Wait, wait. 73, I'm pretty sure 73 was the same year The Omen came out, so he might have won it for that, and that soundtrack is great too, but the soundtrack for this movie is so emotional and so un-Jerry Goldsmith. It, if you heard it, you wouldn't even recognize that it's Jerry Goldsmith. It's so good. Every single aspect about this movie is fantastic. Fantastic. This movie is godlike. Godlike. And if you are interested in watching the movie before I go on any further explaining spoilers and stuff like that, click a link below. It is up in full on YouTube or whatever, and I highly suggest watching it. The movie is two and a half hours long, so you're going to need some time to sit down, but guarantee you probably have time because you're sitting here watching me rant in front of a camera anyways. But it's so worth your time. So worth your fucking time. The film opens with a great scene. A great scene. And, and it's very calm, and it's very quiet. You hear the wind blowing, and it, takes, it opens up in France. And you have, you have no idea who the main character is yet, but it's just this man explaining, here's what's going on, here's what's happening. And you guys are being sent to French Guiana uh, for the crimes in which you have committed. And a quote that he says is, France has disposed of you. Which is very, sort of sets the mood right from the get-go. And then he says, now put your clothes on. And they're all butt naked and they're putting their clothes on. Yeah, of course, you don't really see anything, but they all put their clothes on just to humiliate them more. And then... It, they start walking down this, this street in, in Paris, which is phenomenally well shot. The numbers that they had on this scene are extremely well played out. And I think Franklin J. Shatner did an amazing job shooting this scene and adding some of the, the weariness or the weirdness of this scene, of the awkwardness going on. And then we get introduced to Louis Dega, played by Dustin Hoffman, who this movie actually introduced me to Dustin Hoffman, and he's a phenomenal actor. And his wife just sort of waves as he walks by, because because Louis Dega is a rich counterfeiter. He's made all of his money counterfeiting, and he's filthy rich. And then all of a sudden he waves back. The girl walks away, gets in a car, and drives off. Clearly, right from there, she doesn't give a shit about him. Which immediately you feel bad for Louis Dega because his wife is just dating him for the money. And then we get introduced to Steve McQueen who plays Papillon. You know, and this is my favorite movie that he's in, without a doubt. He just plays this role so good, which... I guess I should explain what Papillon means. Papillon in French means butterfly, which is sort of an allegorical meaning in a couple ways. Uh, one is that it's a butterfly, which means freedom, because butterflies go anywhere they basically want. They're free to fly. And the other thing is, he also has, it's a nickname, I, unfortunately I forget his real name, but he has a tattoo of a butterfly on his chest, which they make plainly clear in the scene where they're walking down the street. Amazingly well, his girlfriend comes up and she's like, you'll be back, Papillon, you'll be back. And he just sort of looks at her like, yeah, I'll try to be back as hard as I can. And this person beside him, who we get introduced to a little bit later, 
goes, no you won't. Just flat out says, no you won't. Just flat out says that. No humanity, no anything. Just shows how despicable the scene is. And on top of that, there is no music during the entire first act of the movie. No music. The first bit of music by Jerry Goldsmith we get is on the island when they arrive at French Guiana. Which I think is a brilliant editing move by the part of Franklin J. Schaffner. I think it was brilliant that he did that. It just sets up the eeriness. And then once you get to the island, the movie truly starts. Which is an amazing, an amazing idea. Okay, so they get on the... Again, I make analyzes, but this movie, there's just scenes in the opening that I need to bring out. Once they get on the ship, the French close this gate, and everybody stops setting up their hammocks. And just look at each other. Everything was dead silent. As you hear the lock. And then all of a sudden, everybody slowly gets back to doing what they were doing. That is an amazing bit of eeriness that was done extremely well in this film, which carries out through the first act of the film extremely well. And so then we, Pepion and this guy who said, no, you won't, this is actually where you kind of like this guy that said, no, you won't. He starts explaining that it's his second time that he's going back. He managed to escape, got caught, and now he's going back. Uh, and he starts explaining how, how terrible the conditions are at French Guiana, which was unbelievably true. This movie depicts French Guiana like no other movie really has. And this movie depicts it rather gruesomely, effectively, and just very, very true to what it really was. And, 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 and then there's this, this scene where uh, uh, Papillon and this guy, they're talking, saying, Hey, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get a boat and get out. He's going to try to escape. Because this island is apparently unescapable. And he, and this man says, I'm sorry, but if your plan fails, I'm not going to get screwed up. Which, which you think, like, uh, just me explaining it, you think that this man is an extremely despicable character, extremely unlikable character, and sort of probably going to be the antagonist. No. Fucking no. No one is really the villain in this movie, which is another great thing. No one is a villain in this movie, but yet at the same time, no one is really a good guy either. And, and that's one of the things that I really like about this film, is that everybody is sort of treated equally. Uh, as not being too good, but yet at the same time not being overly bad. And that's amazingly well done. Even Papillon is an extremely good. He's done some bad things. Even though apparently, which is another great thing about this movie, is that you never really find out if he actually murdered somebody or not. Because he keeps saying he didn't. But then again, everybody on this island is innocent. Which I really like. I, I, I like that. But, but you still like this character because of how Steve McQueen plays it. And, um... Anyways, you think that the, the man who said, I'm not going to be a part of this, is, is going to be the asshole. But really, he's not. He's playing the human element of that scene. He is being the human in that scene. On, he's talking about how he wants to survive. That's his number one goal. He wants to survive. And if this plan fails, he doesn't want to get caught up in the middle of it. Because what happens if you get caught? You get two years in solitary confinement, which sucks. And then if you get caught again, you add five more plus the two to your already termed sentence. So basically what happens is everybody who goes to this island is staying at that island no matter what. They have no chance of getting away. They have no chance of going home. And this scene plays it out. This scene explains everything without not having too much dialogue involved with the scene. That is what good filmmaking is. Now, Louis Dagg and Papillon are the two characters in which you follow throughout the entire film. These are the two characters that you actually like, and these are the two characters that you follow and sympathize with the most. And at first, it's a very awkward partnership. Louis Dagg, again, has lots of money. He has lots of money with him. And then uh, Papillon is a strong man who knows how to fight. So Papillon says, let me be your bodyguard if you finance my escape thing so he can buy a boat and get away. And Louis Dega is timid at first, but once somebody is, is murdered, he's suddenly like, okay, yeah, I better do that, out of fear. Because Louis Dega is a really sort of scrawny, 
sort of socially awkward character. And so that's what actually happens. Uh, Louis Dega and Papillon become friends over the course of the movie. It's not right off. In fact, once, uh, once they arrive on the island, that man who, who says he doesn't want to be a part of Papillon, uh, Papillon has a knife, and he cuts his own leg and says, I don't want to go to Devil's Island, because if you go to Devil's Island, there is literally zero chance of escape. And so he cuts his own knee. Cuts his own knee, and it is depicted in this film. So that when he, he, he'll purposely fall and make it look good, so that he can go to an infirmary and, you know, have some time to think. And later on, and this is great, everything about this movie ties together. Uh, suddenly later on you hear gunshots going off and then a bunch of French soldiers and guards are running by saying some guy in the infirmary has gone insane. And it's that man. That is an amazing aspect about this movie is that every single character has a role to play. Be it big or be it small. Anyways, back to Louis Dega and Papillon. The first scene that they really bond together is uh, a great scene where they're, they're logging and somebody shoots a croc and he said, you gotta go out there and get it. Well, the croc's only wounded, so it's just fucking agitated. And it's them, it's actually kind of funny. And it's them dancing around it, saying, you get the head, I get the tail. They try it, they fail. Okay, now you get the tail and I get the head. Back and forth, and it's really funny how they're bouncing back and forth. And it's actually a really funny scene. And that is when they truly start bonding. That is when those two actually, you know, stop becoming, you know, just, just a guard and, and a man-to-guard relationship and becomes something more, be actually becomes a great friendship. Now, the first escape attempt is actually um, a great scene because there's several es escape attempts on this film. It's actually a very, very uh, sort of impactful scene showing the friendship between Papillon and Louis Dega. Louis Dega just broke his glasses, and he's bending over to reach it up, and he gets kicked by a guard because he says, no breaking out of line. And Papillon's trying to defend him, and then the guard punches Papillon, and Papillon punches back and darts into the woods or else he would have been killed. And eventually he gets caught. And uh, the entire time, Louis Dega, it cuts back to Louis Dega, and he's actually really worried about Papillon, hoping that he actually makes it out of there. And then during... This entire part where he comes back comes the solitary confinement scene, which in my opinion is the most disturbing, gruesome, fucked up scene ever. And it's him in this room, there is one rule there and that is no talking and he's there for two years. Two years. And then to find out, once, once they start speaking, he sees this man on the other side while they're popping their heads out these little holes. It's hard to explain unless you see it. But he looks over at him, he's pale, uh, this old man is pale, and he's clearly dying. And he's like, tell me, how do I look? And then Papillon lies saying, you look swell, you look okay. And then the next time they pop their heads out, that man is gone. Now, why did I bring that up? I'll bring it up a little later. Louis Dega knows where Papillon is and starts in these bucket of water putting little pieces of coconut in there to keep him healthy during the solitary confinement, and Papillon knows who it is. And uh, I, I think that's an extremely great scene. And on top of that, he also keeps going one, two, three, four, five, walking back and forth in the entire space of the room, uh, just and because it takes five steps to get back and forth. And as the time in solitary confinement gets worse, it goes from five to ten which just shows how weak he's getting. Well, eventually the guards find out about Louis Dega putting coconuts inside the water thing, and so they totally, they put him on half rations, they put this black thing over him so no sunlight can get in. And he spends six months like that, six months without sunlight, or like hardly any food. And that's when he really starts getting weak, he starts going insane, and the makeup on him he looks like shit. The makeup looks so good on that scene. Anyways, then he pops his head out, and the new guy where the old man was, he asks him, how do I look? And he's all pale, and he looks almost like the old man did. And then that man says, you look swell. And Papillon realizes this, and he's like, fuck, I'm screwed. And so then there is this scene 
where uh, Papillon eats the note, which has Louis Dega's name on it, and eats it. And he, he thinks he's going to tell the guards, or, or the, uh, Franklin J. Schaffner projects it like you think he's actually going to rat out Louis Dega. But when he sticks his head out, he says, I can't remember the name. And so the guards let him off, and they believe him, and then he gets released after the six-month term. He actually lives. But then after that, Louis Dega is, you know, helping him out. You know, he's, he's feeding him, he's helping him get, get his strength back, and you get the sense of, you scratch my back, now I'm going to scratch yours. And Louis Dega is actually helping Papillon, not, at, not because he needs the protection, but because he is a friend. He's probably the closest thing to a real friend that he has ever had. And probably Papillon is almost the same way, but in a different sense. Because you really see that they start liking each other. They, they're bonding, and they're actually becoming great friends. And so then they escape again with this queer guy. Literally, queer guy. He's gay. Uh, and they run out in the woods. Louis Dega breaks his ankle. And then they, they find a boat in the field of leopards. Le uh, leopards. Oh, the makeup. The makeup in this movie is fantastic, but it looks so gross. This is probably the best depiction of leprosy I've seen in a movie. It's this guy. And it's disgusting. But anyways, they, they get on a boat. And during that scene, his leg, Louis Dega's leg gets infected. And the gay guy cuts open it to, to let the infection spread. And it's so gross. This movie is really gory for the 70s. In fact, I actually think it's pretty gory for today. Because what you don't see, you hear. And that's pretty fucking gross. Uh, it's, it's so well. This movie is just so good. There's so much that I can talk about in this movie. But everything, everything in this movie is good, from the writing, to the editing, to the acting, to the cinematography. Everything is good. And, uh, God, there is no sympathy on any of these characters in these movies, because half of these characters just die. Like, they die. They fucking die. Uh, like, there's one guy, when they go on this island... And he just, suddenly this trap falls up and, and stabs him, kind of like what they did in Vietnam. Because he was an escapee. Right in front of Papillon. And he just dies. And you think he's actually going to become a main character. No, he just dies. And then when Papillon gets, he thinks he's found sanctuary at this nun place, the nuns just turn around and backstab him. And look at that, he gets five years of solitary confinement, which they don't show. So then he goes to Devil's Island. The last part of the movie is on Devil's Island. And it's like suddenly the pace of the movie goes from this to like boom, just down. And that goes from everywhere from the editing to the acting to the music, everything. And by this time, they're all old. They're like probably in their late 60s, early 70s. And they're all really old. And Jerry Goldsmith's music just accompanies the scene perfectly. Perfectly. I'm not even beginning to scratch the surface on how phenomenal this movie is. And Louis Degas has gone insane. Well, he's still there, but like he's hallucinating about ghosts and he's walking around and and uh, he, he's not Louis Dega. And Papillon sees this, which is actually kind of tragic because Papillon is still there. And so he discovers a way off of the island, Devil's Island. And he has to jump into the waters and float out every seventh wave. And him, the last scene with him and Louis Dega is so good. And, and actually a really sad scene. Dega and him are just looking at each other. They're all ready to go. And then Louis Dega looks at him and says, I can't go. And Papillon says, I know. And they embrace. For the first time in the movie, they actually kind of like embrace as like a hug. It's really tragic. Really well done. Uh, and you just fall in love with these two characters as the movie progresses. And they never forget about each other. That's the thing. So C. McQueen goes off and says, I escaped you bastards, because he actually is floating away. And he does make it to Sanctuary. And then the end credits roll. I'm going to talk about uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score here. It is really, really good. Um, 
I like Jerry Goldsmith, but this movie doesn't sound like Jerry Goldsmith. It sounds... This is something that I think Jerry Goldsmith wanted to do more of. Because, unfortunately, Jerry Goldsmith got wrapped in with a bunch of action movies. And he kind of got sick of composing those, even though he still did them, because he's a gentleman. But, uh... He gets... I think he's, what he saw here was a chance to experiment with something not action-y. Because there really wasn't that much action in this movie at all, other than a couple of the escape scenes. Most of it, the music is very calm, or very, very big, to show the scenes. And I think Jerry Goldsmith had fun with that, because it was something new for him. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, the action, Star trek -y kind of soundtrack. It was something new, and something more compelling. Uh, it was really just phenomenally well done. I bought the soundtrack, it's on my iPod, it's amazing. Uh, really just check it out, but I recommend watching the movie first and then listening to the soundtrack. Uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's powerful. That is the word to describe the music. It is powerful. So what would I give this movie out of four? Well, you gotta be dumb not to, I, you gotta be dumb not to like this movie. I easily give it four out of four stars. Uh, I was so happy to see this movie again. So happy. And I owe this movie a lot in terms of how I make movies without even realizing it. I, I knew after watching it this time, I, I said I owe this movie a lot, how I shoot stuff, how I edit stuff, how I uh, work with actors, how I shoot the actors. I owe this movie a lot. I actually owe this movie a bit more than King Kong. That says something. So I give this movie four out of four stars. Give it a watch. And the next time I'll be on here, I will be reviewing all the Star Trek movies in Star Trek-Arama. So stay tuned for that, bitches.